Hi, this is Maggie Rose, and you're listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. I started this podcast to showcase women in music who inspire me and who I want folks everywhere to know about. My guests are icons in contemporary music, independent artists, studio musicians, hit songwriters, and power players behind the scenes. All of them challenging the status quo, respecting the hustle, and leading the way for women following in their footsteps. Salute the Songbird is a platform for women in music to share their stories and let their voices be heard. And everyone has a seat at the table. Welcome. I'm so excited to kick off the show, and I can't think of a better first guest than Ruby Amonfu. Ruby is a multifaceted talent. She's a Grammy-nominated songwriter, buddies with Reese Witherspoon, I mean, it's awesome, an activist, a model, a galloping gourmet, a transplant from Ghana, West Africa, although she has been a Nashvilleian for most of her life. But most importantly, she seems to have a huge heart that's recognized by everyone who's met her. So I can't wait to dive in. I think I'm ready. Let's do this. Hi, Ruby. <gasps> What's up? <laughs> it's so good to see you. You too. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, uh, this is so much fun already. I'm so excited to talk to you. I have just a million things I, I want mean, to jump into. Look at how amazing you are. Like you're doing your own podcast. What's up? We have so many mutual friends and everyone that I run Mm -hmm. into just absolutely loves you and such a fan of what you're doing. And I've been a fan for a while. So I followed your journey and you whatever for so long. And it's like, you just know when somebody has like the similar energy, similar goodness putting out into the world, you know? And so I latched onto you pretty quickly. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. So cheers. I'm outside in Alabama having, Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Our um, our little wine fridge stopped working. I really, really wanted a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. And I might just drink it hot. I might just grab one hot, hot yes. glass of wine. There's hot no shame glass of wine. <laughs> I'm feeling fine with a hot glass of wine in the summertime. <laughs> Um, yeah, and there's no shame in throwing an ice cube in that Sauvignon Blanc, so okay. if you need to go do that, you most certainly can. Go get you know that one. All right, give me 30 seconds. You got it. <laughs> it's recording. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. So, cheers. Cheers. That looks really good. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> I'd like to welcome my guest today to salute the songbird, the incomparable Ruby Amonfu. She's not only an incredible musician and songwriter, but she's a chef, she's a model, she's an activist. She became a naturalized citizen of the U.S. in her 20s. She moved from West Africa, Ghana at the age of three and came to Nashville and experienced what I call a baptism by fire in your exposure to music. Ruby, welcome to Salute the Songbird. We, of course, salute you, and I am so happy to have you on today and and get to talk about your awesomeness. Thank you so much. I am really excited to be on with you. I'm really honored and just appreciate what you you do for your fellow your fellow mates, your fellow femates. My fellow femates, that's right. And you're an artist that I admittedly have had to admire from afar. Uh, I've been a fan through social media and all the things that you've released, I think, have had a profound impact on me and so many. But thank you. Because of what's going on this year, I haven't gotten to maybe interact with a lot of artists in our community the way we normally would backstage or sharing a bill together. And uh, having you on today is my way of being able to continue that socialization that's so important to me as an artist and yes, in mingling with my people and those who inspire me. So absolutely, we have we have to find new ways to stay connected. So thank you so much for pulling me in. Now you have what I would call a unique American experience, and the fact that you moved here to Nashville at such a young age, I think is a testament to the fact that you were like a sponge when you moved here. Mm. I read somewhere that your parents didn't listen to a lot of secular music around the house. So how did you really begin your musical education? Yeah. So we listened to only 
gospel music, Christian contemporary music, and classical. Even jazz was too progressive. We weren't allowed to listen to that. But we did have little cassette and AM, FM boombox sure. in our bedroom. I shared a bedroom with my sister. So we always had that in there. And as far back as I can remember, I would sit on the floor by my bed. And I was always the kid. I was a middle child. And I was the kid who I didn't didn't want to go outside and play. I wanted to stay inside and and play with the boombox and play with the vinyl records. I, that's what I wanted to do. And so that's what I did. And I can remember sitting there on the carpet next to my twin bed with the radio just turning station to station until I locked into a song that I connected to. It didn't matter where it came from. It was always when I just had some some private time and quiet time to do that. I connected to everything that way. But at the same time, when I walked outside of those bedroom doors, I was super happy to hear people like Mavis Staples or um, Mahalia Jackson or... Jesse Norman or Kathleen Battle or Cindy Morgan. I was happy to, you know, soak up that type of music as well. And it wasn't until middle school, I was a seventh grader and met a girl named Mary Beth. And she was sitting in the lunchroom. She was like a kind of a middle semester transfer. And she was sitting by herself in the lunchroom. And I've always been the person I want to be with the person who's sitting by themselves in lunchroom, or I want to be the person who's in the corner by themselves at a party because I am also that person. And (laughs) I've been that person many, many times. So I just beelined it to her and said, you know, can I be your friend? Can I sit with you? And she, from that moment on, became my best friend from middle school through all through high school. And in middle school, she um, introduced me to a lot. She introduced me to the music of Elton John and Madonna specifically. She gave me Like a Prayer on cassette. Nice. And uh, yeah, and so, and then she made me a lot of mixtapes. She was the one who made me mixtapes and, you know, so, you know, with Prince and, you know, all, all sorts of wonderful people, Michael Jackson. And, and that's when I really realized that, you know, I, I'd always wanted to be a songwriter. And to be really honest with you, I thought I was a songwriter at five years old. <laughs> you know, it, it was just something I was writing songs no matter what. I was just writing. I, I couldn't help it about everything. Um, so around 12, 13, when I started hearing songs that were conversational and that also had um, for like a way of inspiring people, but in real in real life terms, like I really love gospel music and how it's inspirational on a general kind of larger landscape. But I really love being inspirational just on a face-to-face level um, and getting down to what, you know, what we're really going through. And so that's what secular music was for me. Sure. It was the ability to, to speak for real. Like, right. Just like Which you do being. so well. Oh, thank I do, you. I do feel that intimacy in your songwriting when I'm hearing it. And I think it's funny that, you know, you're not alone in the fact that you're a performer who in so many ways, performers and songwriters share this huge Mm -hmm. portion of their lives, yet there is a bit of an introvert Mm -hmm. in most Mm -hmm. every really Mm -hmm. introspective songwriter like yourself because you have to allow for those quiet times to present themselves as well so you can find that way to connect with people and be real, as you're saying. So thank you, Mary Beth, for (laughs) introducing all this music. And I am busy. (laughs) <laughs> and Bizzle, I hear that wide spectrum of influences in your music from gospel to pop. And I think the consistent theme in your music, whether it's music you've written for your own solo career or you've helped other artists find, is is authenticity. There, there's a compassion and an empathy that you demonstrate in what you do that I think is why you're so beloved in the music industry in Nashville. I think that you you. give people some medicine through your music. And this year has certainly been no exception to that. Mm -hmm. And I find it really impressive that in 2019, you released three volumes of music. (laughs) And yet you've continued to be so prolific 
in 2020, which for many artists was a year that proved to be difficult. You know, they couldn't find the music within yeah. them. Do you feel right. like you've been a little bit bolstered by the contention of this past year in your writing? Or is it something that you had to overcome and, and push through? I had to overcome and push through. You know, when the country shut down, I allowed myself a moment to sit in it. And I allowed myself not to write because I'd also spent the last two years writing so much, having such high output. Like you said, 2019, three volumes. I had had such high output that when that happened, it was, I don't know if I'd call it an excuse or a reason, just something to say, you're allowed to take a minute and breathe, you know? And so I did, I allowed myself to do that. And I just fell into the arms of my kitchen. Yes. Since that's the other major creative side of, of me. If it's not writing songs, it's cooking and creating in that way. And all I need is one or the other. I, you know, I can survive for months with one or the other. And so I took that time. And then it just started in me just stirring up in me probably in May when the dis-ease and the disease mm -hmm. that we have in this country and the systemic disease that we have here, it started stirring up undeniable things in me. Like there was an undeniable force in me that had to speak on it, had to write about it. And so I started to do that. I started to write about it and I started to write about change. And mm -hmm. there's a song that hasn't even been released yet. And the chorus is like, I feel sorry for you, mm -hmm. you know, and that's all that I can say, you know, just people who, who don't see, who don't get it. That's the compassion I'm talking about. You know, it's not anger. It's I feel sorry mm -hmm. for the fact yeah. that this is invisible to you or that you can't have the empathy to feel the plight of other people. And you certainly did respond to the dis-ease and the disease with this recent project, mm -hmm. Beautiful Noise, that you collaborated mm -hmm. on with all of these women. And I want to get to more of that. But first, for people listening, yeah. I kind of want to backtrack with your story. I mean, you have seven albums. You suggested that you thought you've been a songwriter since you were five years old. But in reality, that's not far from the truth. Mm. You were writing these songs mm. and you released an album yeah. while you were in high school, I believe. Yeah, I recorded a record between 15 and 17 years of age. And um, it was finished in the summer right after high school graduation. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that even with such an early start in music, that there could have been an alternative path for you ultimately, whether it be cooking or, or some right. other creative kind of pursuit? I had also thought that maybe the route I would take would be an interior designer. Interestingly enough, I really get into, I mean, I'm really keen on architecture and I just like how points come together to create something authentic, you know, whether it's furniture or a wall or a room. But music was just always, the source was always pushing me towards music. And it was always just something I did. I mean, writing songs, uh, it was just like, you know, I didn't even have the thing like, I want to be a star, you know, whatever that thing is we sure <laughs> that's out there that we we know exists it was just I like to write songs I want to write these songs and actually singing was so secondary it was the means to an end to get the songs that I wanted out into the world out into the world it was like I will use my voice to do that but I never actually wanted to be the artist that mm. was something that just that I realized it's a means to an end and then only after that did I really start to own who I am in that right and to own right. my place I was gonna say you certainly don't appear to be a reluctant artist now before me today yeah no I own it I own it now I'm not running from it anymore no yeah that's exactly it I'm not running from it anymore you're a nurturer it's you want to feed people you want to make their yeah. spaces cozy and then, yeah. of course, what you do with music is very nurturing as well. That is it. You hit the nail on the head. How do you know me so well? I'm a nurturer. <laughs> you are a nurturer. Well, you put yeah. it out there. We can all tell. <laughs> Thanks. One thing that has always been 
impressive to me in your many years of experience is that you're such a great solo artist, but I also consider you to be one of the ultimate collaborators out there. And you've worked with people who, frankly, on my most confident day, I might be like shitting my pants a little bit because Jack White, <laughs> for example, he's he's famously known for his musicianship and you know, Nora Jones, like these are consummate professionals who are not yeah, pop stars. Yeah. They're hard right. hitting musicians. I think what I want to know and what would be helpful to me is hearing how you are able to trust yourself and your abilities mm. in those situations, because as supremely talented as you are, it seems like you were just saying yes to all these opportunities because, of course, they wanted mm-hmm. you to be involved. You know, where yeah. where does that fearlessness come from initially? And you've proven yourself to be worthy of those opportunities. But sometimes I feel like I can be bulldozed if I don't trust myself. That is an extremely incredible question. I think probably what comes to, to mind and to heart first is I have had so many opportunities to be fearless since I was little. And I think those reasons include coming to this country as an immigrant with a funny accent and having to go from thinking, oh, I've got to prove myself, I've got to prove myself, to then realizing, no, I just have to be my true self, my true self. And oh, right, that's what gets accepted or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that being okay with that and living in that authentic space It was very, very hard. And I lived (laughs) the majority of my childhood, like almost trying to get into the psychology of that. Why is it that people, classmates, whatever, why is it that some classmates want to make fun of me Mm. or want to make me feel like I'm not, you know, good enough or worthy enough? Why is that? I really made it like a question, something Mm -hmm. that I would search. And I started paying more attention. And I've always been really observant, but I would observe these specific people who were what I found to be the cruelest. And as I searched, I realized it's not me. I am worthy. You know, it's that whole hurt people, hurt people situation. And in that, I found so much love and acceptance for other people, which inevitably made me find that love and acceptance. So when I stepped out into the world um, outside of my parents' home and, you know, just barreled through, I just met everyone, no matter how famous or whatever, I just meet everyone with love and acceptance. Something I had to do, I taught myself, I don't know, maybe I was 19 or 20. I was thrown into a lot of big situations, Mm -hmm. whether it's meeting, you know, and singing in L.A. Reid's office or, or Ahmet Erdogan's office or all these, you know, there were scenarios and, you know, being flown to, to London and, and Scandinavia and, you know, by my young self, I was like, I could sit here and be just the most nervous human being or I could do this one thing, which is I would see everyone and pretend like the person I was looking at and having a meeting with or having a dinner with, I would pretend they were my family. And I would, like their eyes would turn into a brother or a sister or an aunt or a cousin. And I would literally psych myself out and just imagine that person as being a family member. And whatever I needed, it's like for the people I was most, I could have been most nervous around, Mm -hmm. I would make them my sibling, right? And the people that I needed to gain more respect for, I would make them an aunt and an uncle, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that is something, that familiarity is something that I have been complimented on just to be real because I make, it's true. They're like, you know, I feel so comfortable and you feel like you're so comfortable, Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, I am. And whatever that little exercise is, it really does bond people. When you're not coming trying to get anything from somebody, you're like, I love you unconditionally. It sounds so weird when you're saying it to somebody that you're, you're just working with. But starting from that point of unconditional love and unconditional acceptance and seeing them, you know, as family, it really has made a difference. And I think it's the reason I have gone so far and wide in my experiences. 
I love that. And also what a powerful mind you have to be able to Mm. envision people who some might perceive as adversaries as your own family. I think that you mentioned the word exercise in reference to this practice, and it certainly has to be something that you've really put a lot of effort into and and created a discipline out of. But you also said something else, a very important phrase early on saying, I have to be authentic and you can either accept me Mm -hmm. or not. And I think Yep. Being so aware of who you are as an artist and putting those two options on the table and having no in-between, you eliminate that ambiguity with yourself and others around you by doing that. And I think that you'll always be able to make great music if that's what you're running on. Absolutely. And to that point, and not everybody will think it's great music and not everybody will accept it. And you know, but isn't that the stuff of life? I mean, we have just experienced an election where we know that firsthand you don't have the same viewpoints as somebody else, mm-hmm. um, but it doesn't invalidate your own. It doesn't invalidate what you do. And I feel like that's the biggest thing we have to learn. It's the biggest thing we have to learn. When the artists that inspire me most, like yourself, are people who are firmly individuals. And Mm -hmm. I know that we've probably encountered some feedback, I'll call it that politely, on social media where Mm -hmm. we are entertainers who deal with people from all walks of life. We're exposed to all the different cultures. So when we want to speak to our political viewpoints and do it in a respectful Mm -hmm. way, by the way, Mm -hmm. if people threaten to then cut us off or not be fans anymore... I think if we're doing what you're saying and being ourselves from the get-go when we're making music, then we can say, Mm -hmm. hey, well, you weren't really a fan in the first place because you missed my message of listening to one another. And if we all let our record collections suffer because every musician ever in the world doesn't agree with us on all of our beliefs, then we're going to have a very limited amount of things to listen to. So I think that you're doing a beautiful job being inspiration to so many in being vocal. I wanted to get back to this song that you collaborated with. I have to look at this list because it is like an estrogen bomb (laughs) of talent. Uh, Hillary Lindsay, Linda Perry, Haley Witters, Brandi Carlisle, and Alicia Keys perform this song. Lori McKenna, Mm -hmm. I love her. And of course yourself. Am I forgetting someone else that you collaborated with on... Beautiful. Brandy Clark. Oh, Brandy Clark. I love Brandy Clark. And yeah. I, what now? I, I got to go on tour with her and listen to her every night and it never got old. Oh, I know. You know, that song takes balls to write and it came from a group of women during a very contentious, tumultuous time. But yeah, you listen to it and it's timeless. It's obviously a song about 2020, but it's mm-hmm. it's something that I think can live on. And we hope so. And it will. And and I love the first line of it. Like, I have a voice. It started out as a whisper, mm-hmm. turned into a scream. And I think that's what yes. everyone's everyone was feeling. They were getting more and more frustrated. And then we all collectively let out this scream yes. together. How important is it to you? And I think I know the general answer. To sow those messages of unity into your music. You know... I have always felt the responsibility piece. I feel like that goes back to how I was raised. I was raised to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I was raised in a way that it's not all about you, you know, <laughs> it's about your, your output too, you know, and I have also had to learn how to balance that because being raised that giving is better, you know, just better to give than to receive. I also find that sometimes I forget to stop and check in with myself and, you know, in that, but the piece of unity, it's just something that, you know, I was really lucky to be surrounded by that in my middle and high schools. It was like, I mean, basically looked like my high school looked like fame, you know, (laughs) and it was incredible to, you know, I got really lucky. And then I went to the first college I I went to was Berkeley in Boston. And that, again, was just so diverse. 
and really connected me to so much of what I believe in, like a self-belief. And I feel like, I don't know why I've never had the whole, I've got to protect myself in this, like there's, I feel like a lot of us, even though, you know, we want to say we're a part of the whole, we get so hung up on this set thing. Like, this is who I am. Don't knock it. Don't whatever. This is me, you know, and it could, I mean, I'm not even talking about politics. I'm just talking about who you are as a person. We get so set up in, this is me. I'm immovable as opposed to being like, I'm ever changing. We have to trust that we are ever evolving and are changing. And we also have to align ourselves with people who are, you know, down for that cause too. But I've always said we're more alike than we are different. And I just try and connect those dots as much as I can. There's also zero tolerance here with me in certain ways. So I'm definitely not Ma Teresa in any way, shape or form. (laughs) But I do think we are more alike than, than we are different. I totally believe that. I don't think that's a Pollyanna view or anything like that. One thing that I think is so badass about you is that if we looked at your discography and every song you've been a part of, the list would be very, very long. So you're very prolific as a songwriter and artist, but you also have an ability to cover songs by artists that you Mm -hmm. love in a way that is so convincing and moving. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. a Dylan song that you cover, Not Dark Yet. Yeah, yeah. I love that song. And a Brandy Carlyle song. Shadow on the Wall. Yeah. And that's a tough thing to do, but I feel when I hear it, Mm -hmm. tell me if I'm right, it's your ability to recognize such a finely crafted song that you can move out of your own expression and pay tribute Mm -hmm. to these artists that influenced you. And you almost highlight a new meaning. When I hear these covers that you've done. And I know that's a tough place to be, but it's so cool that you've done that so often when everyone knows that you can craft your own original material. What's the importance of the covers to you? I tell you, it might be different than maybe what you you think or what people think, but that was a time in my life where I had not released a record in like a record of my own, a solo record in uh, about 13 years, 12, 12, 13 years. I didn't realize there was such an increment of time. Yeah, yeah. So there there was a period of time where, I mean, it was a really long stretch. I had released a solo album in 2003, and I didn't release another solo album until, until um, uh, Standing Still. And that was? Uh, gosh, 2015? 2015. That's correct. Yes. My research shows that you're right. (laughs) Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I'd, you know, I'd put out a couple of singles in 2013, but you know, and I had been a part of a duo, um, you know, and Sam and Ruby. Yep. And that for me was the way that I was able to transition back into putting out albums and not dark yet was the song that allowed me to find my voice in that way again, like my own thing. And it's so so wild that I was singing a song I didn't write and finding my own voice again. Right. And the first time I performed that song was at the Bowery Ballroom in New York. And it was during uh, this festival called Dylan Fest. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time I did it there. And, And afterwards, I went to the tiny little dressing room if you've been in the Bowery it's like this you know tiny and I went back there and there were so many people in that tiny dressing room I ended up going into the bathroom and just standing in the shower like not turning the shower on I was fully still in my little red dress and everything and a bunch of girlfriends came in there with me and I just like wept and I had begun again like I had found my my authentic voice and you know I mean because I had done all these like I said, done all these collaborations and things. And, um, and that's where I had, you know, allowed myself to feel safe, but it was because I didn't want to come back out again and be like, I'm going to be a solo artist. And that was the song that did it for me. And so I realized, you know what, this is a way to ease back in doing songs by people I respect, uh, singing lyrics I respect by artists I respect, 
there's one I don't respect anymore, but you know, you can look through that record and pretty much know if you know me. I'm going to read into that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can speculate. Right, right. And I, and I just like real talk, that was a song that I did not choose myself. I've been there before. Yeah, yeah. So, but to that end, that was the album that got me back. It brought me back. It brought me back to this. Yeah. And that's the only record that I have put out into the world that I didn't write to this day. That's it. Right. Well, you have many, many records out there. And I think that you poured a lot of creativity into that record to get inside these songs and breathe new life into them. The Ruby touch. Interpretation, right? It's like, it's such a powerful thing. And And it's not acting. It's like you said, it's breathing it in and then breathing it out and, you know, and interpreting it, you know, and I called them interpretations, you know, and I didn't call them covers. Right. That's a distinction for sure. And I imagine it would be so daunting to reemerge as a solo artist, but it's not like you were dark for those years. You were in the duo Sam and Ruby. You were part of the Peacocks backing Jack White. The music never stopped with you but yeah. like I can certainly appreciate how intimidating it would be to deviate from that yes, collaborative yes. path that you were on is there one concise thing that you could say you gleaned from the experience of being in these bigger outfits that weren't the solo artist pursuit for me at the time it was a place to get confidence back um, it was also a place to be able to step out but be a character um, for Mm -hmm. just to feel, to test the waters. You know, I had to figure out what was true and authentic for me creatively and being able to be, it's not even in the shadows because I wasn't in the shadows, but I was able to be, you know, incognito or someone else at least and try these things out and Mm -hmm. test these, you know, test ways of singing or of moving you know, and, I, and there's like even around that time, I did I did this wacky thing called the Sing Off on NBC, yeah. where I was in an acapella group, a bunch of Girl, friends. me too. And, I wasn't in the no. Sing Off, but I was in an acapella group. Oh my gosh! Oh, okay, take note. Very clever. Very cheeky. Love it. I love it. Oh my right. gosh! It, that's some hard yeah. singing to do. Yeah, it it really is. None of us had ever like you know. I mean, you know, we've had choir stuff, but that <laughs> but that group being you know being on doing something like that, it was like, well, somebody's gonna dress me up, somebody's gonna do my hair, makeup, and I'm gonna just do whatever they tell me to do. But it's it gave me. It let me try out some things. Exposure. You have guidelines when you're in an outfit. And I've benefited from that. You know, I have my band, Them Vibes, and collaborating with them mm-hmm. is so fun. And I feel supported. I feel like there's a consistency there. But I'd be lying if I didn't say that, you know, they give me some give me some guardrails when I'm working with yes. other people. When you're left to your own devices, it's beautiful and it's terrifying. So... And I wasn't ready. I think it's really cool that you bridged that by looking yeah. at these songs that you appreciated. I know that you love Dylan's writing, that he's an influence of yours. Yes, very and much. You know, I can yes. hear that when I hear your cover. So I think it's really cool that you can write circles around most people, but that you pay tribute to other writers and artists. And the production is really cool. And I also, one more cover I have to mention, and this is why Reese Witherspoon, like, sings your praises I believe she discovered you and then used bitch on little fires everywhere would you believe that she wasn't even the one who brought that one to the table she wasn't the one who brought it Reese seems to do it all she's like got her book I know putting I know no it's so funny um so Don Soler who is um the cat of like ABC music um okay in LA and she you know has all these projects going on all the time. She's phenomenal. She is, you know, talk about like somebody who uplifts and champions women. I didn't know Dawn until you mentioned her. I'm excited to. Yeah. Yeah. She's just a champion. She it's just, I mean, she's badass. So she, um, anytime she's working on something that she feels I, you know, would be a fit for, she always puts me forward for it. And so, um, little fires everywhere, 
was, you know, um, in production. And I was just one of the names that Don had put forward to say, you know, because they wanted to get, you know, female voices to sing these songs from the 90s. And so the team with ABC and Hello Sunshine, you know, whoever all the producers were, you know, that was who listened through. And I, to this day, I have to audition for stuff. Like I don't get stuff, you know, just because I'm me, you know, I have to be presented to a panel. Sure. You know, <laughs> like, the panel. You know, I mean, it's, it's on the level, you know. It's just everything is just really on the level. And so most things you know, in the music industry and, for those listening are decided by yeah. committee. There's not, yeah, people, unfortunately, there's not like the rogue or the maverick who's like, I will put my neck on the line. (laughs) So there's usually a panel or a committee. Yep. And got to get opinions. They want to get opinions. Mm -hmm. And so the the opinions came in and the opinions were, you know, of a like mind that, yes, let's, you know, Ruby should do this. And then the song was chosen. And yeah, and it's so funny. It was like, Reese and I didn't even talk about it until after the fact. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> until so after the awesome. fact, you know. Well, that one was is definitely worth a listen because Meredith Brooks and Shelly Pekin, who's both of them female songwriters Amazing. who crafted that song, yeah. and you brought an intensity to it where it's sort of a playful song about the multifaceted nature of a woman, right. but you made it, yeah. brought some gravity to it that I really enjoyed. Thank you so much. And, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the producers too, Mark Isham and Isabella Summers, who is one half of Florence and the Machine. And, you know, it was already, the pandemic had already hit. So we were on uh, FaceTime or Doing it Zoom all remotely. or whatever when I was in the studio. Yeah, I was wow. here in Nashville and, and they were in their various homes and we were making it happen from here. Um, I did a yeah. project like that yeah. similarly over the pandemic because you're kind of like the music can't stop. And in a way, mm-hmm. it was one of the more collaborative projects I've done in recent memory because I could involve people from all over the country because we were going to do yeah. it from our bedrooms or our studios. Right. Like, that's so cool that, right. you that happened. Good for you. Gosh, I can't believe there's so much life. I can't believe this year has... I feel like that happened like a year ago and it, it was this year. I know this year feels very, very short and very long, depending on the moment that you ask me what I think about it. Yeah, exactly. I've had lots of time to peep at your cooking and I want to cook with Uh, you. I want to write with you. Do you you cook? I do. I I want to throw down with you you in the kitchen. I would love to. But you have a a finesse that, you know, I'm, I'm a home cook. I am too. So again, it's about like that design aesthetic. I just love a palette. I love putting something, you know, that looks like, and not always, like sometimes I'm like, give me a pot pie, you know, and make it messy, you know? <laughs> yeah. I would say my cooking's more rustic, whereas you cook like Faramundi in Andive. Like, <laughs> I, I, I've seen True. what you do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've man. seen it. And that's, well, that's some it. elevated yeah. shit right there. So well, you'll have to teach me, teach me your ways, the best things to get to know people over food and music. Yes, and we can definitely learn from each other, always, always. No, one thing that I noticed in my stalking of you in preparation for us talking is that you and your husband, Sam Ashworth, collaborate together. Mm -hmm. You're both Grammy nominated songwriters. I work with my husband as well. He's part of my management team and he's the most patient person I've ever met. I I got a patient one too. (laughs) Right. They, they have to be, I think. Yeah. If if you're married to an artist, then God bless you. (laughs) And especially when he's creative too. What is that? Like for you and for him, if you can speak for him, and you guys are fortunate to have had such a beautiful, successful year with your collaborations with her, who's one of my favorite artists. I I love Hard Place and Fate. And thank you. You know, you all got to be part of one of the biggest albums of 2019, but Mm -hmm. you also share it with the person you love. Do you feel like? Because you've hit this 
echelon of success that that propels you both forward as a couple? Or do you feel Mm. that, and it could be yes to both, does it put pressure Mm -hmm. on you to Mm -hmm. hit that touchstone again? Like every time you write, is there some expectation that it's going (laughs) to yield this kind of song again? Gosh, no, well, no, there, there isn't to that expectation. And I think because Sam and I, we're, we're similar in a lot of ways where when we sit down to write, we don't have an expectation to write what society calls a hit or to write anything. We just want to write something beautiful and true. And that is truly at his core. And that's truly at my core. I think, you know, obviously what, what has happened to us since coming together, because we were friends for 10 years before we dated and then eventually got married. And once we finally came together as a couple, it just grew. It was almost like a formula that had not yet been connected. It hadn't been poured into the test tube, like to the, to for everybody to realize. And, and we feel like there is some code that has been cracked and it's really weird. Like it's wild. We, you know, we consider that, you know, and obviously we both are still autonomous songwriters and, you know, in, in our separate forms and we still, you know, have our own sessions and everything, but it's been pretty wild though, when we write together with another artist, especially. And that's been happening a lot now, which is wonderful. You know, in pre-pandemic, one of my most fun things is to, is to have an artist come into our home and I can put together a cheese and charcuterie platter, you know, or something (laughs) a little special. And I'm like, eat and let's write and eat some more, you know, but when they come into our home, you know, I definitely step into that mama role and Mm -hmm. nurturing role. And Sam is, you know, has his thing where he's, he can be serious, you know, he's got that. Yeah. But the things that have been coming out of this house, when we pair up, I don't want to, you know, jinx anything, but up to this point, everything has taken, everything has landed Again, it's just like a, it's like a formula and it's like a code that has been cracked. So yeah, I do feel like it has propelled us. And now people are reaching out to write with us together oh, cool. just as much as they're, as they're saying, you know, want to write with Sam or want to write with me, you know, there are people who are saying they want to write with, with that pair, you know? Um, and I think, it, I mean, this is the thing. I think it's important to, to like, to recognize like, I do some things great and there's other things I don't do great. Sam does some things great. There's other things he doesn't, you know, and like the collaborative thing, like I'm such a fan of co-writing. I'm a big Mm -hmm. fan of it. Me too. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. and obviously there's some songs that come on our own just as songwriters, but I just love collaborating. And I really am a believer. And when I say better together, I really believe it. I believe we're better together. And so there is something that, that I think happens when you can be open to other opinions um, because there's nothing wrong with telling just your story, but if you lean into, you know, the opportunity, not the responsibility necessarily, but the opportunity to help tell love that. different stories, you know, levels of the story and different stories, why not do that? So that's what I feel like collaboration and co-writing is. Amen. I think it substantiates mm-hmm. that idea that, okay, don't really know this person I'm working with yet. I want to present this idea mm-hmm. to a crazy large group of people. It validates yeah. that what we're talking about is mm-hmm. readable and having that common ground. Yeah. And you said autonomy, right. you've been able to maintain that. And even though people want to write yeah. it as a partnership, I think it's really cool that you can be in a partnership with someone, but also maintain your individuality and not be so precious when you guys do collaborate to be like, we better get another Grammy nominated hit out of this one because then it'd right? be really daunting to sit down and do that. But you oh, know, yeah. you guys are doing yeah. pretty well. You've got a good batting average for that. We are super counting our blessings and we think that there really something did happen when when we got together. Do people ever discourage you from being open about your marital status? Whoa, that's an amazing question. 
I mean, it's sort of like common knowledge most people should know, but sometimes do you get dissuaded from... I haven't dealt with that, I have to say. I haven't dealt with that. It's funny, before I got married and, you know, when I was dating, you know, and I I had a, a few serious relationships, I think then in those times, people would dissuade me from saying I was in a relationship, mm-hmm. right? Like you're in, a, you know, and to say it's better if you come off as single. But girl, who has the time? Do you experience I mean, that? Well, I've been independent for a while, but I definitely got that about mm. marketability and like your sexuality and and man and all of that. I don't think that this is an experience unique to women. I think that men have to be sexy and like, if you're Mm -hmm. a front man, you have to be captivating. But I, Mm -hmm. I think, and I hate this word, but Brene Brown has made me (laughs) embrace it. Brene. Yep. The shame Mm -hmm. game for, for women in any of my perceived failures. I feel like there's always been someone there to, attribute my failure to something that I had done. And I, I do think that that is something that I share with a lot of my peers who are women in this industry. Mm -hmm. I've been told, Mm -hmm. Hey, we can't use that interview because you didn't wear the right bra or you shouldn't talk about these hot button issues. And this was yes, admittedly early on in my career. And I've had to liberate myself from a lot of that. You seem to have that kind of figured out already. And well, I had, I had no, to get but there you, in the last couple of years, but, but no, but I experienced a lot of that. I experienced a lot of that. You know what I, I chose to do with it. It wasn't like I didn't ex- experiment not being woke. I had moments of like, okay, let me just do what they say, mm-hmm. you know, too. So we go through it. We're made to go through it. It's put in our face. It's shoved into our face like a piece of cake we don't want. You know, it's like, I didn't ask for this piece of cake. I don't want your cake. Take your cake. Right. I don't know why I said cake. What am I thinking about? But Because cake is delicious. <laughs> why not? And yeah. cake is ass. So there's that too. We're talking yeah. about like the marketability of yes. that. And to me, yeah. you are beautiful. And I know that you've done modeling. You. And oh my gosh. You are oh, also. You. you are too. Thank you right now. My. You are. You my are. My life attire. I think <laughs> on the inside and out is important mostly to me. I know that there have been times in my career where art has been secondary maybe to the other components that go into play and promoting what you're doing. My question to you is, do you see music being what you're always going to do regardless of how important those other factors are considered to be by everybody? I love that you're asking me this, and I love that you're asking me this today. This week has, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because of renewed hope. I don't know. But this week specifically, I had more assurance. I have more assurance than I've ever had that I will do music for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I will write songs for the rest of my life in whatever capacity that I can, but I will create, I will create music for the rest of my life. And this week has been the week that that peace came over me in the realest of ways. What do you attribute that to? Why, why this week or this moment in time? But honestly, it was the election and the election results. I was teetering on hopelessness even though I was always going to continue to fight, you know, for what was right. And, you know, I had become in this time period, you know, an unexpected activist in, in a, like a real way, you know, and like people are like, when are you going to post about music again? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> in a bit, but we got some more, you know, important things I'm dealing with right now that I just can't sure. not like, I just couldn't. But after the election and after the results, that hope, it was like, I realized a couple of things. My sister had said uh, she'd actually written almost like a, a, an op-ed, this thing of whether he wins or not. Mm-hmm. And it was really special. Actually, 
if you don't mind, I, there's like a part of it I want to read because Please. it hit home to me. And I just. What's your sister's name? Pearl. All right. You so know, an excerpt from Pearl. Yeah. After I voted, I thought, well, I guess there's nothing to do now, but wait. But guess what? The pandemic didn't magically disappear after I slid my ballot into the machine. Innocent people who had their lives stolen from them didn't rise from the dead. And my vote certainly didn't change anyone's mind about anything. So what are we waiting for? For someone else to give us the results so we know how to react, so we can plan our next moves, so we can celebrate or mourn or gloat or take to the streets again? Nope, not this time. We've been waiting for someone else to make the laws or change the laws or defend our rights or speak up for us. We've been waiting to vote out the ones who haven't had our backs. We've been waiting for someone to swoop in and save us when we've been here all along, protecting our own, doing the work, and actually accomplishing things while politicians argue on TV. There's more, but I'm telling you, when I read that, because I, I'm straight up going to tell you, I had had in my mind, <laughs> I had only shared it with my husband, but I said, if Trump wins again, I will be hard pressed to leave my house. I will probably shave my head and I will write from home and I will become a recluse. Hmm. And that's what I had thought because I just couldn't take it anymore. Right. I thought like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do it in that way. I have to protect myself and just stop. I've got to stop but I read that and I realized even before the results, I realized I will keep going no matter what. And so I had that peace in me and then the results came and it was, you know, somebody had attributed it to, you know, it was like waiting for the election results was like being awake for your own surgery, you know, like, <laughs> some, you know, being, being awake for your own like open heart surgery or something. Or, I haven't heard that. But it's like. Right. And then, That's you know, good. but I, and I've, I've had surgery a few times and, mm. and just like when you come out of it, when you come out of the anesthesia and, you know, you, you go in and you're worried like how, what, what the outcome is going to be, you know, and even some brutal surgeries that I've had, it's like, when you wake up, you realize I'm still here. Mm. I'm still here. So no matter which way that surgery would have gone, we're still here and we can and must continue to work, to work Absolutely. and to, to fight and to practice and to exercise in all the ways that we have been, because that's the only way we're going to stay healthy of mind, of body, of spirit. Absolutely. And to be fair, for anyone who listens and thinks that this hasn't been an unrelenting four years for someone like yourself, they're forgetting yeah. that like, we've sustained so much women have sustained so much with the me too movement i know you've been mm -hmm. vocal about your experience with ryan adams and not getting mm -hmm. to have shared an album that you worked on for so many years being disillusioned by the world around us with 2016 mm -hmm. all the things happening in the supreme court racial tensions boiling over then this election yeah. like this is a moment of clarity in a long, long period of time where ambiguity has been at the forefront of all of our lives, this virus, yeah. uh, us yes, canceling yes. all of our shows. Like the reason I'm doing this podcast is to connect with people because that void is so wide and gaping for me to interact with people that I love and admire. And yeah. for one moment, whatever side you fell on, I think you and I are pleased with the outcome, but regardless, it was nice to have just something that indicated with certainty, okay, this is the decision that was made. I totally agree that regardless, we are still here. And yes, I love yes. what you did with Devin Gilfillian. He's a buddy of mine in recreating the Al Green record. And, and yeah. seeing my friends like that being amplified and, and people having some awareness, like this discomfort that we've all gone through has at least made those who, who want to be more empathic mm -hmm. and empathetic to mm -hmm. what's going on mm -hmm. with everybody. 
you, you've done a really beautiful job from my viewpoint in navigating what has mm. been a crazy time to be not only an artist, but a human and a black woman. And, you know, this is a formidable time. And I think that our music will hopefully be better because of it and we'll come together yeah. because of it. But yes, I, I, I have to hope so too. We'll, we'll all be here regardless of what happens going forward. That's right. I'll be here with you. And, yes, uh, yes. We'll do I it like, together. I, I'm so, so thankful that you took the time to talk to me. I could talk to you all afternoon. And I know that you got your mama in town. So Ruby, Amonfu, I love you. I, I respect you so much. Thank you for being such I a beacon you. of light. And I respect you. Keep kicking ass. And uh, I like to close these discussions by not focusing on what oftentimes we talk about, which is the plight of being a woman in the industry, but talking about what you perceive to be an advantage of being a woman in Mm, the industry, mm, in in, mm, in your craft. Yes. What's something that has been a good thing because of your unique perspective? Well, it's going to go right back to being a nurturer is the allowance, if you are a nurturer, the allowance to be that and how it is not defined by whether or not you can or cannot pop out a baby, you know, (laughs) just the ability to have a spirit of nurturing and being allowed the room to nurture and so many people need to put their head on a shoulder in one way or another right now and women get that privilege of you know you're allowed you're empowered in being a nurturer and it's not weird (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's not weird to say I care it's not weird to say come here baby Yeah, You know, sit a while, hold my hand, tell me what's on your heart, tell me what's on your mind. So I think for me that is super huge, is feeling empowered as a nurturer. I love that. And you do it very, very well. Thank you, Maggie. There's one lyric. I know I said that's how I was closing it out, but (laughs) I read this and it's from Hard Place with Her. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, I was like, that is a lyric written by a woman, if I've ever seen it, and I might be wrong. It's in the first verse. You're telling me Mm -hmm. to relax when I'm reacting. Oh, yes, 100%. And any woman listening knows exactly why I saw that. And it just lit up in my brain as something that you're allowed to react without being hysterical. And you're allowed to react without being emotional. And Mm -hmm. I think you just keep reacting to what's going on around you the way you do by putting beautiful music out there and being Mm -hmm. the Ruby we all know and love. So thank you so much. And we salute you. you. Love you too. Thanks for being on Salute the Songbird. Uh, Thank you so much. I'm so honored. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with the lovely Ruby Amanfu. Big thanks again to Ruby for being so open with us. It was such a treat to spend time with her. You can find Ruby at rubyandmonfu.com and make sure to follow Salute the Songbird on Instagram and Twitter for news and episode updates. And to keep up with me, my music, and my touring calendar, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at I am Maggie Rose. And you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash I am Maggie Rose, where you can get exclusive Salute the Songbird content, along with new music, live stream concerts, and more. You've been listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. The executive producers are Kirsten Cluthy and Brad Stratton from Osiris Media and Austin Marshall. And the show is edited and mixed by Brad Stratton. Original music by Maggie Rose. Please subscribe to Salute the Songbird on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast content. And if you like the show, please recommend it to a friend or leave us a review so that others can enjoy the conversation. Thanks for listening. And to close out the show, here's When We Were Kids by Ruby Amonfu.